empowered young women from Southeast Asia. Um, our first um, our first panel member is Ms. Kumar Chan Ostananda. Um, she works um, as uh, a Thai art, uh, she, she works on a Thai art history project, of course, in Thailand. Um, our next panel member is uh, a heritage practitioner and a researcher at Simeo Smapa, um, Ms. Subichan Sukhanoko. Um, and our panel member, last but not least, Ms. Celia Ann Tolit. Sorry. Um, she is a researcher and she manages art collections at the Art Foundation in New York City. All right. Okay, so um, we will begin the present. We will begin this session with a video. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Fan. I'm from Denmark. And let's take a climate change box in August. The first one is climate change. Can you come with me? languages in Southeast Asia. We've also seen how um, in certain languages, some words in the English language, particularly you've seen carbon footprint, is not translatable to these languages. And for the element, for the essence of time, we will now move forward to the presentation. I'm not sure I believe this is not a cue to start this weekend, so as you can see with our So as you can see with our video, we have um, a lot of different languages in Southeast Asia. There is diversity as well as plurality. So even though there is similarities in the of languages, like Indonesian and Malay, uh, we have a lot of different language families in Southeast Asia. So they're totally different. We have Austronesian languages like um, Malay and Indonesian, and we have uh, Austro-Asian languages <coughs> like Vietnamese. So, some existing challenges in communicating climate change is that the language is oftentimes overly formal. And as you can see here, there's a lot of laminated filling words, so the language, um, the word creation is not natural, it's hard to understand. And there are oftentimes communications in dominant language and language. So, resources that are distributed are often in English or in, in national languages, and they're not very accessible to people. And that is not acceptable because um, minority ethno linguistic communities, so minority communities who 
will speak these homologized languages, but it creates this proportionate effects of climate change. And when faced with these barriers, um, it would be an incredible change for them from participating in the movement. So movement is all not accessible. And we also have some Southeast Asia specific challenges here, such as for language diversity and for so in some countries there are not a singular uh, official English. Uh, for example, in Indonesia or in um, Singapore or in the Philippines or in other countries, there are not so many languages that are localized to a specific region, but there's no formal language. And so we felt that it was important to put um, language justice on the agenda of climate change, and we need to address um, these gaps in making movements applicable through language justice. And that is not mentioning the knowledge that we have from indigenous languages. And as you can see in the Okay, I'm going to make So as you can see here on the map, um, biodiversity hotspot and um, language diversity hotspot coincide. So the more biodiverse an area is, the likelier they are to uh, also post um, an incredible amount of languages. And this is specifically true for Southeast Asia, as you can see. There's a region on the map. Uh, so, imagine the amount of valuable knowledge that um, the very diverse languages of Southeast Asia hold to the local um, biodiverse environments, the local flora, fauna, weather patterns, crop period patterns, and stuff. So, this is another reason why it's so important to put uh, language justice and just addressing gaps in communications in general. We talk about climate justice. It's not because uh, just because uh, we want to make it accessible to everyone. It's because these languages hold invaluable knowledge. So after we already recognize uh, the importance of the panel, we can take a seat. So we just mentioned earlier about how important um, and how diverse languages in Southeast Asia. So uh, with that, we decided to do a research with our um, um, colleague from Malaysia. So four of us um, make an interview um, with the people in Southeast Asia with, with the study group. In, um, we study, uh, we talk to people who speak Burmese, Mario, Lao, Thai, Yo, Mong, uh, Bagarayo, and other current related languages. Um, Filipino, Khmer, and uh, Malkan on up the southern Thai and also like northern Thai and um, some dialects in the northern Thai. So uh, our core of the question that we try to discover is that uh, we want to know whether um, whether they can understand some basic technical term related to climate change, and also we want to know that how do they receive this climate change information, where they learn about this, and also. Um, do they have any participation or included into any um, decision making processes related to like um, the climate mitigation in their locals? So with that three core um, of scope of what we want to know, we uh, we have like designed the interview with a question set of question, and this is a result. Um, we interviewed like a in total of like different um, samples, and with the interview we we discover that some terminology doesn't really um, exist in some languages and um, we also learned that um, so, so for example the term that that, can, that every language is like have or like can be easy to understand would be like environmental conservation though um, the the hardest one for, for people to understand would be the climate adaptation climate resilience and um, the carbon footprints it, really um, need a lot of explanation 
So you can see from the key plan here, like the, the rate the percent the black the, 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 the term that I went into movie cannot cannot like understand at all or cannot find the term. And the green one is the one that ah, is exists in the language and the um, pale green one here represents like something that need a long explanation um, and it would, uh, there is a term explaining that word. So there is a, a little bit of fun thing that we discover along the way. For example, um, rather than the fact that the environmental conservation have is a, like one of the words that have the most like popular and like everyone can understand that. But the term like um, <coughs> carbon footprint and green watching, which is really new term that repetitively um, mentioned in any like um, UN um, document or kind of policy or guidance that exists, we, we also learned that um, these terms, when they describe, we have to like compare with their everyday life. For example, when I, I, when I ask some, someone who speaks of uh, um, Barrio, how to, how, to, uh, how, to, how to say carbon footprint, um, they, they, they were like, oh, um, I have to uh, explain to my grandma, it's, it's, it's like a footprint uh, of the tiger in the forest for that footprint and then carbon is like when you warming yourself with like some um, fire like how do you call it fire one fire and then this is have like this smoke going on so with all of that explanation he have to explain further what does carbon footprint really mean and for example the term um global warming we interview one of the people, uh, people who speak your and then they say oh is this doesn't that mean the world is exploding soon or something like that and the, the green watching um, in um, in the north in 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 some language in the north being um, <laughs> like rat liar is more like a liar. And there is no like and, and then explanation needed. So it's really interesting to know how how people perceive the language by tying it up with their everyday life experiences. And after that, we um, we would. Do you have any other thing to add up for the? Yes, so I was um, interviewing a policymaker for climate change in Thailand, and um, I would like to be generous in saying that the, the policymaker um, thinks that these these words in local languages within the region are not necessarily vital to policy making, um, which was something that I found surprising during the interview. Um, but at the same time, the policymaker suggested that perhaps we could use terms such as plan adaptation, autonomous adaptation for the local communities instead. So this is the current gap that um, we seek to reconcile, and we still wonder whether there is a possibility for reconciliation in terms of this. There is additional information on how they perceive that these um, climate related news. So um, a lot of people who we interview um, express that they um, only receive it like a one way thing because um, they will, the local authority might uh, appoint them for some activity, but it wasn't for the inclusivity. It's only for the information. And um, most of the time that they do not know what's going on. And it's really hard also to explain. For example, if one community speak um, this certain language of the locals, they have to study the dominant language of that area first. For example, in Thai, if you speak Barrio, and then you have to study Thai language, and then you have to study English in order to understand something. So it's not um, it's, just, it, it's not easy, and it's in terms of like the writing accessible information is really really is challenging right now because of uh, the language barrier. And people have to like instead of like this. Okay, I understand it, and it's okay. Learn three times, <laughs> understand it. Come, come back to explain to the whole community. So that is the challenges that we found during the present, uh, during the interview and uh, during the research. Um, with that, um, we also have some call for action, like because this is a part um, of the research that we have conducted back in the January, and then we also like some messages that after we gather together and conclude everything. Want to convey would be well, first of all, I would like maybe you can start with Celia. Do you what is your call for action? Or so, so, our call to action is put language justice at the heart of the climate agenda to ensure that everyone is 
especially minorities and people of color. So, people who suffer disproportionately from climate change can participate in these movements. Create and support policies and initiatives that embrace South East Asia with linguistic diversity and culturality. So, we've seen a lot of uh, a rise in uh, diversifying the language of construction in South East Asia. So, that was a simple start. Support youth led organizations that spearhead equitable access to climate literacy within the region, such as the Southeast Asia Exchange, which our wonderful community here participated in, and recognizing that climate change is an intersectional issue, encompassing language, social justice, cultural maintenance, and much more. Also, maybe one of the things that we also think um, when we were conducting this research is also that maybe the education of the local of the education um, should be extended to local languages also because like sometimes it's really important because in one classroom you know like we have people with different um, diversity so like our languages of course like when you teach this certain language or dominant language and maybe it's excludes automatically the, the student who maybe speaks some certain language or maybe the whole classroom is full of people who speak this language but you have to like use the same um, education tool for the whole classroom which is really not fair and also maybe it should it can be more inclusive for those people so in education, um, because we are speaking right now in the education hub, so we think that is really one of the things that we can add on for a call for action at this point. Can I add on to the Southeast Asia Exchange organization? So it's an organization that I've been a part of for like three years now, and I've been part of the knowledge team. So what I do is I curate topics to um, potentially um, create panel discussions for students who want to participate in the exchange online. And the problem that we found is a lot of students who are interested do not have like the same proficiency level in English. So what we've talked with like the organizing team, like should we just only accept student applications who are proficient in English just because we want them to get the best out of the program? Or should we just accept people with like working proficiency or someone who might benefit from a translation so that um, programs or panel discussions on climate literacy, um, linguistic justice could be more applicable to all communities across Southeast Asia? So I just wanted to share that with them all. All right, thank you very much for a very uh, fascinating topic that you just shared. Um, I find it really interesting because um, the, the climate change as an issue has different dimensions. Um, and it's very interesting also to note that the immateriality of that challenge is not just about, for example, the implications of this, um, of climate change towards indigenous communities, their, their certain practices, but also in their languages as well. As what we've learned from their presentation, they talked about the different um, existing challenges, such as um, the formality of the language of, um, uh, let's say, UN documents related to climate change um, that, in a way, are not accessible to local communities. Because when I was listening to your presentation and also reflecting, um, how, how do we actually translate or how do we explain to local indigenous communities about COP28 or about um, the very formal words that are written um, on these UN documents? Um, but also similarly, they have words in their languages that are also difficult to translate in English. So in a way, um, you also talked about how certain words are, are untranslatable, or let's say it's not a very straightforward translation that, for example, if you if you put the color, if you translate color green in, in another language, it would be very easy to translate, right? Um, so I guess what I wanted to also get into is that, um, I already want to ask you questions. Okay. Um, okay, so for my first question, because you talked about the many um, challenges about bridging um, the language barrier, right? Um, how are local languages safeguarded or protected in your countries? Are there specific projects or programs that actually um, protect these languages? Maybe um, in an institutional level, maybe in a ministry of education, or maybe um, in formal schools, 
Or are there initiatives, actually? Or are there even recognitions that these languages are actually major? Because we've also pointed out that um, there is a diversity of languages in Southeast Asia. But considering that there is diversity, it's also interesting to note that there are a lot of languages that are dying in Southeast Asia, too. So how do we, so you can start, Kamari, if you'd like? Sure. <laughs> So I want to talk about a conversation I have with Celia on language revitalization. So endangered languages or languages that are dying is quite critical to climate change because you you are talking about this an arena of concept of ideas and ideologies that is going extinct just because people are not speaking it, just because people are not writing it, just because people are not learning about it. So I had this conversation with Celia to know. Um, how her indigenous community is currently revitalizing the human language. Um, and I've discovered that human books in the U.S. are currently being authored, so now Asian Americans who are of human descent can learn human despite the diaspora, despite um, the migration and different historical displacements that may have caused um, language um, endangerment in the first place, so I thought that was very interesting. There is nearly zero written publications. However, the Indian diaspora who lives in the U.S. and I'm particularly based in the U.S. Um, has started popularizing this alphabet that was created for missionary purposes. Um, it was created by a missionary in Laos and for the purpose of spreading Christianity and it was uh, popularized uh, in the U.S. and now the Indian diaspora in the U.S. is creating publications and is offering and writing these incredible names and bringing it back to um, the homeland in Vietnam, Laos, and China. And that is one of the way that we're seeing language being created and being to grow from our eyes um, from very flexible and, uh, communications like radio, especially in mountainous areas, to bringing publications back from the diaspora, bringing intellect back from the diaspora. But in terms of language preservation, Vietnam is not very good. And neither of our partners have a school country, so I'm trying to school. But um, yeah, so we have around, in Vietnam, around 180 languages being spoken. However, Vietnam only recognizes 54 ethnic groups. And so there is a huge issue surrounding recognition who is and isn't an ethnic minority. Because when 54 ethnic minorities being officially recognized. There's not <coughs> enough trouble getting funding for each of those ethnic minorities. And there are, what, 100? Around 100 more that not recognized. So, what funding is allocated to them? What recognition is there that their language and culture is in danger or being threatened by the government? And the answer is really zero. And our, we also have a really bad issue of acknowledging that there are different languages being spoken at home compared to the language of construction at school. So all languages of construction at school is Vietnamese and Vietnamese only. And so that is an issue that the Vietnamese government particularly have to address is diversifying the language of construction at school, um, recognizing that these children are speaking different languages at home. There needs to be formal education on those languages. And, but the encouraging news is that um, as we continue to globalize, um, a lot of um, and people from the same minority group uh, are uh, having conversation and dialogue with each other. New people from Vietnam are talking to new people in Thailand and from the US. So, with more dialogues and more discussion, it's a lot But yes, I also like um, all the part with this kind of thing because, like, I have a friend who also speaks some certain language mm -hmm. who is maybe, of course, obviously not uh, recognized uh, in the uh, in the dominant language of the country. 
and they have this initiative of like depending on themselves because they cannot uh, pay on the authority of course because they, they want to just fund for one language and what about like 84 or more that is exist in the country and then uh, we they they kind of have this picture dictionary kind of project to be able to explain sort of some information like climate change uh, mitigation or mitigation of like um, flooding or some situation that need to be communicated like because people won't have any information because of the announcement or anything from the TV even that some of the other people who didn't study Thai wouldn't understand that so they have they have to create this picture image because there's no script like what CNA just said so that happened more and more but depending on public sector uh, not any authority or something like that and there is not any law act or something for conservation of languages especially even yeah i'm not, I'm not sure about like global tools but yeah in in in, in, a, in a country wild i don't think that if this one exists so far if there is you great but no i don't think so but yeah um that's the answer for your question of how are we doing we're doing really not good but uh there was someone trying to do it on their own hands so that's why we need a lot of hands recognizing these issues because we really need someone who's pushing it on and really co communicate um, to everyone for real because this is really a critical issue, global issue of climate change. Mm -hmm. Right, I find it very interesting about what you said about having um, this standardized policy that actually protects languages. Of course, if it's, it's, if it's going to be institutionalized, it's institutionalized, that's going to be a very strong instrument but the very fact that, as what you have mentioned as well, that in certain countries, um, how can this recognition be actually possible when the very recognition of communities do not actually happen? Like certain communities are not recognized as indigenous. Um, so I find that very interesting. But I also wonder how young people in your immediate communities, or maybe in your country as well, um, how woke they are, or how, um, in terms of recognizing um, language diversity or in terms of speaking even your own local languages because i come from the philippines and in my country our official language is both filipino and english and english is a bit more known that i wonder how um, young people feel about speaking their local languages or their national language is there i don't know if it gives a sense of nationalism oh. Course, is it? It's giving about a dominant language. What does that even mean? Like a dominant. So yeah, but in terms of like um like the cognition and activity related, um in the university level there was certain like you know like those kind of festival where they like um let's talk in northern dialect kind of um, festival like in, at least in my uni we have that and then the southern one also and then in in some local community uh, I think around ten years from from year back and if they have this initiative of like talking local language for example in Rayong uh, province they have like this um, specific dialect and then they encourage uh, people to talk in some certain way or something that is a starting point also in the northern one um, people in for example in Pratt province where I wrote my thesis about people also have these um, how do you call like local curriculum called PAS it's I mean like how do you call it local local, like local study uh, of, 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 of their own province and then they in, the, in there adding the language into the curriculum. So it's kind of nice, but yeah, in the entire semester you're learning about like how many days a week, but yeah, obviously it is not enough, but I think that that, that, that localism also is competing up on this graph right now, but for, for me, I don't, I still don't see like the, the, the reaching out part from the authority that much to make this whole holistic view complete. Um, becoming lesser and lesser, and if 
a, a language doesn't have to teach and you do not want to learn it. So, for example, if you're good at speaking or you're indigenous language at home, you go to school and you make fun of the word. Or if a teacher can you speak and you speak and you do it, you do not want to learn the word indigenous language anymore, no matter how much your parents might teach you. So, if we keep up this uh, policy of maintaining one singular language on the structure of schools, so they will decrease the energy prestige for the indigenous languages that we have in Vietnam. And on parts of Southeast Asia, and the next generation will not want to learn the language anymore. So that is a great issue that we have to address. I think in Thailand, the central high accent is very tied to um, modernity or at least nationalism, but I do feel that there needs to be a separation from how you feel about nationalism and your language. You can celebrate the linguistic diversity within your country while being nationalistic. Um, so I, I, for institutions that would like to implement um, this is diversity. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. Um, so we're nearing the end of this very interesting conversation. I wanted to ask you, um, because you talked about reconciling language barriers and the challenge of actually reconciling it. But of course, um, in, able, in order to be able to come up with solutions, of course, we need to take baby steps, right? Um, so for the three of you, what do you think would be the important baby steps to take um, in being able to bridge the barriers or to break these barriers in order to create bridges so that we'd be able to communicate climate to the people or perhaps the local communities or the indigenous communities to be able to communicate to us because they're the ones really are who have intimate relationship with nature, right? So in a way, kind of like a vice versa kind of relationship. So what do you think would be these main steps? I can start. So I think it's not a them and us issue, it's a we issue. And there's just because you exist in a, say, multicultural, multi religious country does not mean that uh, you are working against one another to try to um, communicate your agenda or whatnot. It's more like how do we just um, communicate our diverse experiences within a similar narrative. But a narrative that is inclusive and equitable to all the communities involved. I say that Vietnam is slowly taking the baby steps. Um, we have um, previously it was a word just one of people, one humanity crafting, and now it's becoming more of a word that defines the consistency. Word I guess we have a good consistency. But we're very so those are at least baby steps compared to what it was in the 20th century. Um, but embracing those differences and making progress, going towards recognizing that there are even more different ethnic groups than we thought there were, would be great. And practicing that, they're heading towards that goal, no matter how small the steps are. I think in the country, like I think my example earlier already explained or illustrated how small steps have been taken, like the teacher, um, dictionary, or even like the integration of um, local education for their local languages. I think that was um, really a baby steps, but in more than that, I think that another thing it would be like the, the, the reach out of multidisciplinary like approach because, for example, this research already showed that the term like environmental conservation means having meaning in every language, even the, even where it is, like wherever it is, like any locals were taught by the language, right? Because how that's how people communicate, from, like of how to take care of the environment. So, so that can be like integrating with maybe conservation approach to conserve the to conserve the the, the, the language because like in the wisdom um, that inherited it also have this kind of um, knowledge in protecting the nature, for example. So if you want to work on this um, approach, then you integrate more and more languages and then like 
um, tied it up together, doing this patchwork together. So that the big work of, of, of communication of even not only in the climate change, but we happen to have this as a critical, um, urgent situation to communicate. But yeah, just tie it up with your thing as much as you can. If, if also like working in different platforms, maybe respect of the language and embracing the diversity uh, in the in every area with the respect would be one of the key to, to take a small step as of one person can do. Mm -hmm. I love how you answered it. I can actually come up with different hashtags for it. Hashtag we issue, hashtag embracing differences, hashtag yes, we have four more minutes. I recognize that. Thank you very much. We're on time. We're wrapping up. <laughs> um, so yes, but to but thank you very much. Um, but to just wrap up this very beautiful conversation, I, mean, I wanted to ask you in your own languages, what is a beautiful word that is related to nature or the environment or conservation that you can share with us that you find beautiful? Or perhaps we can also ask the audience if you have a beautiful word related to your language that is that you find beautiful that's related to nature or conservation or climate or earth. Even though the term um, environment in, in my language, like the sink, wet, long, it's like everything surrounding you, and then like when you put it with conservation, when you put it with something, is reflecting the, like how can you say, like the inclusivity of, 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 of your view, like sink, wet, long, like I'm not thinking of the conserving what is it around you. Like I think that that is, that is that is really inclusive term because it's not only focused on nature, but also culture, also people. All of that in holistic view. That's cool. Exactly. I think it's really, really beautiful. Yeah. Any terms in other language? Do you happen to be able to give us an example of your language? Because like I'm here in your home and it's like beautiful every day. I walk on the street and then hearing people say, "Is there any word that you can think of?" Maybe. I have like come up with any word, a term or a word. Maybe a word or a term will do. The yes. to the nature or. That you like. In Arabic. In Arabic, yes. 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 Never, yeah. never be able to speak that. Uh, in yes. our nature, the most like a symbol for, for like, that's related to nature, which is the palm tree. Nahim. 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 Nahim, yeah. It's a palm tree. It's the popular in uh -huh. So we always, when we are thinking about nature, about, we always relate to palm trees. Oh. Yeah. I mean, how do you say it again? Nahil. Nahil. Nahil is, Nahil is the, like, not a thing, it's, um, like, it's a, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of palm yeah. trees. Oh. And one is Nahil. 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 What does that mean? Nahil is one, one, one palm tree. Ah. Yeah, Nahil is oh. also so cool. Yeah. 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 Okay. That is very, very interesting. So special because everything like um even the logo of the cops and also like the any design yeah, for your cool. building for your architecture yeah. architecture um for the um, um urban design even like the the the, the palm beach kind of yeah, yeah, it's also palm. Palm. It's so special for you right? know, yeah. that you imply it in everything that's so cool. Yeah. Is Mario? Sure. The natural side is just the word of nature. I mean, I, I, I can't really think of any other specifically pretty words in Spanish for, in terms of nature, but nature itself is kind of a pretty word. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So I think that is the way we approach things and we treat everything as a speaker, even as a chair, a table, a piece of plant that we can pluck from the ground, something that we have it exactly, especially for our mom, because they're really, really like, good, sustainable mindset. How about you? In my the language. Moderator. Yes, so the moderator. It's 6.30. Um, oh, no, that's not an escape. That's how I escape. So there is a, for me, a beautiful word in Filipino is Lutian. Lutian is a, is a translation for the color green.
but it's also um, it's a deep it's a deep translation of color green because um, it, it it reminds you of a very relaxing environment something that something very cool something that when you look at it you find solace so I think it's very beautiful and on that note we're ending on high six thirty uh, thank you very much for our wonderful empowered women who are fighting for the environment fighting for culture, fighting for diversity. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. And have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.